Our interviews for this season of Family 360 were recorded before our launch in January 2020. So these current unsettled times give our guests' recorded conversations the valuable test of time and circumstance. We recorded this interview with poet and author Lucy Shaw in 2019, months before the beginning of the global health crisis. With over nine decades of accumulated wisdom, Lucy's writings speak to the surprising wonders of life and the riskiness of living. Welcome to Family 360. Poet, author, and speaker Lucy Shaw was born in 1928 in London, England. She's lived in Canada, Australia, and currently resides in the beautiful Pacific Northwest of Washington State, which is where we met up with her for this interview. She's lectured widely on topics such as art and imagination, poetry, and writing as an aid to artistic and spiritual growth. Lucy Shaw has authored over 11 volumes of poetry, including her newest, Eye of the Beholder. And she's also authored several books of nonfiction prose, including three with her lifelong friend, Madeline Lengel, the author of A Wrinkle in Time. Now that is a friendship I would love to have witnessed. Oh, I bet. I bet they just had the most amazing conversations together, oh, yeah. like a writer and a, a poet, poet and, and oh. just all the symmetry, this creative symmetry. Mm. Now here's a great word picture, Rachel. She identifies a poet as a slender antenna of awareness combing the air for messages. Which is such a great visual of who Lucy is. She is just so open to life and open to experiences. So inquisitive, so curious, always wanting to learn. Yeah. And what she had to say on wonder and on art and on family, it was just so warmly engaging. And she was so filled with laughter. I love the idea that you can say to your child, look in this direction, look this way, or look that way. There's something fresh to enter into your life to enrich it, and not just to follow the well-worn ruts of civilization. That's why it's so important to expose our children to good literature, to good poetry, to good music, to music that's going to make them stretch a bit. It's not just simplistic, but it has depth of meaning. It has a thickness to it. I'm Rachel Cram. And I'm Roy Salmon, and welcome to Family 360. Conversations exploring life together. Lucy, thanks so much for giving us the time today. We're so looking forward to getting to know you better. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I'm going to start with a question, and you just go any direction you want with it. Aristotle stated, give me a child until they're seven, and I will show you the adult. Are there stories or experiences from your childhood that shape the person that you are today at at 90, right? Yes. My dad was a primary influence in my life. I was his first child, and he was 60 when I was born. Mm -hmm. My brother came along two years later. But my dad was an enthusiastic adventurer, a hero in my life. He taught me to skate, to swim. Uh, He made me swim a mile across a lake when I was 10. I mean, he made me do it, but I wanted to do it too. He just infused us with all kinds of activities that went beyond the normal things. He taught us to sail. He made a small sailboat, and to make it safe, he put under the thwarts, he put some airtight containers so that it wouldn't sink. (laughs) And with that, he would send us off, and we would sail for days at a time and swim. Uh, And it just brought me into touch with the natural world that has always been a starting point for my thinking and my enjoyment. Mm. the, the wonderful greenness and growth and beauty that's inherent in creation. Hmm. He just expected us to have the same interests and enthusiasms, which we did. And my mother was always a little worried that he was going to go too far and he was going to bring us into danger, but we survived. <laughs> well, what you're describing, I think, is a life that's almost a past era now. It's not often that parents just send their young children. You're saying you were 10, off into the lake on a sailboat. Uh, I think that's... Do you think so? I I, do. I know that there's a a greater concern about the safety of children abroad in in our communities these days, but 
I don't know. I would treat my own kids the same way. And did you? As you I were think raising I did, your kids? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. What was your mom like? Can you tell me more Mother about that? Mother was a little younger than dad. I was born when she was in her late 40s, and my brother came along later. It was very hard for her because my dad traveled constantly all around the world, and it would leave her with responsibility for me and my brother. She was not an easy person to be around. She had such high expectations that I never was able to fulfill. Mm. My dad was a restless man, and my mother was very different. She was timid. She was very interested in appearances, Mm. so we had to be good. The two were almost polar opposites in personality. Mm. I just actually wrote a poem about my family. I don't know if you'd be interested. I would love to hear it. To, I'm he, actually wondering if I've already read it. No, is it's it a in, new one. Is it from it's a brand new, Holder? Oh. It's not in there. Oh, wow. I'm going to find see that. I've got it. Um, I'll get it. Yeah, do. That's okay. no rush. Hot off the press. Love it. Thank you. This is a real honor to get to hear a brand new poem. (laughs) This poem is called Family of Origin. Our parents keep circulating in the rooms of our lives. Mine are long gone, but if it would satisfy them, I would take my heart out of its cage and gift wrap it for their anniversary. I glimpse them often, Dad reading a book over my shoulder, now and again offering words of advice that might have made sense 50 years ago. The words form clots in my memory, cells bright as blood, a private language unlike any other. My mother demanded mountains of me. I managed to supply foothills. They were lovely foothills, but failure would hang in the air. We still seem to meet in the heart of an old argument, words hanging unresolved, glittering sparks in the dark air. Sometimes when I feel most wrong about how to remember them, I am most right, seeing them as they settled into the grooves of my own memory. I am my own narrative arc, yet I arrange the candles and flowers on my mantelpiece the way my mother would have done it. And for my father, I still write small poems like the ones he carried in his briefcase to show his friends when I was very young. So that's a little picture. It's not a complete picture, but yeah, Dad loved poetry and he loved my poetry and he was very proud of it. My mother always wanted me to stay humble, so she didn't like people to praise my work. Mm. She was afraid it would lead to pride, which is a cardinal sin in her Christian theology. Mm. How yeah. old were you when you started writing? Um, probably three or four, I was putting words together. And, wow. and then in high school, I began to do it more seriously, and I had good teachers. And then in college, I was an English lip major at Wheaton, and I had the most wonderful mentors uh, who just let me do whatever I want. <laughs> well, you have, as I've read your history, you have had some amazing mentors in your life and friendships. Yes, People yes. People that you've walked alongside, peers, yes. Madeline Engel, yes. uh, Eugene Peterson, yes. um, Dr. Kilby, uh, Clyde Kilby. Cl- yeah, Clyde Kilby, who mm-hmm. I think is who brought C.S. Lewis kind of onto the North yes, American he did. stage, right? He was, he, he was the one who sort of enlarged the whole understanding of C.S. Lewis in North America, yeah. And, and he was who really encouraged you to write, I believe. He, he was. So you've had these incredible people to live oh, life yes. alongside, but to step into those relationships, you already had your own sense of wonder and creativity oh, yes. and imagination growing inside of you. Yes. And you started that right from when you were three. So what pushed you along that journey? What fuels you? 
Well, my parents did read good books to me. We didn't have children's books, but we would read good novels. We would enlarge our language powers just by becoming familiar with really good writing and the rhythms and the construction of writing so that it was something almost in my blood right from the beginning. Were your parents reading two adults' books? Yeah. Well, I mean, they were... They were not racy, <laughs> <laughs> but they were some of the great novels of yeah. Western literature. The books that your parents read to you, Lucy, were there any in particular that stick in your mind? Well, Dickens, of course. You know, mm-hmm. David Copperfield, the amazing characters that he drew uh, in his fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the, the one that I remember most clearly. Well, I think often now as parents, we think those books would be boring for children. But obviously that's not true. Well, of course, language styles change, you know, literary styles evolve. But that doesn't mean that you can't gain so much richness from an older pattern of speech. English is such an amazingly rich language. I mean, it's a difficult language because it doesn't always follow the rules. But the richness of it, the the number of words we have at our disposal and and the, the images that they bring to us. And of course, I worked a lot with Madeline Langold. Mm -hmm. She wrote sonnets. They just sort of flowed out of her. She and I worked, I mean, she was, she was my heart friend, my best friend for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And we spent an awful lot of time together. We traveled together. Uh, We visited back and forth. I drove her around the Canadian Rockies. They've just done a, um, a movie of her book, A Wrinkle in Time. A Wrinkle in Time. It's terrible. I, well, it's okay. terrible. <laughs> I kind of heard it. It's didn't get just re- is oh. not so Madeline at it. all. And oh. they skipped all the really wonderful scriptural passages where she calls on the greatness of God, and they just cut all that out and, you know, made well, it so that was disappointing. just a fantasy. And I spent some time with Madeline's granddaughters, Charlotte and Lena, I was with them at Kelvin College last year. We had a, a wonderful public conversation talking about our memories mm-hmm. of Madeline, which is a lot of fun. Was we, she more a poet or more a, a Oh, she was writer? a fiction writer, yeah, for sure. But the poetry just came whether she wanted to or not. And mm-hmm. I published a couple of books of her poems, put them together and made them into books, and, and they're published, so mm-hmm. yeah. One of the things that I find really amazing about poetry as a busy working mother is that you can take these little moments in your day, Mm -hmm. just five minutes to read something. You can just let that ruminate in the back of your head. Exactly. One of my favorite poems is one that you've written for your son, John. You've written it about being a poet. And your first line is, to be a poet, you must write more than you know, hoping it to be true. I'm wondering, can you read your poem, Take These Words? Yes. Because I feel you can even put the word parent in there. To be a parent, you must write more than you know, hoping it to be true. Can I hand you, I'd love can I to. Hand you your yes, book? Yes, I'd love for you to. to read? I love this poem. <laughs> I do too. It's, a, you it's know, my it's favorite okay right now. to be now. in love with your own work. I think you should be. <laughs> <laughs> Take These Words for my son. John on his birthday. To be a poet, you must write more than you know, hoping it to be true, that the words will have a life beyond the moment, taking the shape of their meaning, like rain filling a bowl, drops gathering into a fullness that is wholly fresh and drinkable. I remember the urge last week to describe to the poet in you for your birthday, how a spear of fireweed delivered her pale fluff to the wind, and how bird songs tangled in the vine maples and fell to the dry grass like lace, and the cricket, faithful in his endless summer thrum, sang simply what he was born to sing, knowing nothing of the calm it brings us. He wanted words to tell you how, as long shadows took over the campground, 
and sank into our bodies. Swifts and swallows, stitching the air, took their fill of gnats, while above them the stars circled beyond speech. But I, astonished and grateful, pondering the ongoing script of your life, find no heart words adequate to send. Take these then, perhaps you can fill in the gaps. Mm. I think what I always wanted my kids to have was an exercise of the imagination. Not just interested in facts and figures, but to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. A lot of poems are just sort of guesses and hints. <laughs> and I love the fact that a hint gets you to start thinking on your own. Well, and that's a beautiful experience for children to have. What I'm hearing you saying is, just giving that open space for discovery and for surprise and things not being dualistic. Exactly. Things not being right exactly. or wrong. And mystery. Mm. And you... Mm. <laughs> Can you talk more about mystery? I love that. <laughs> oh, well, mystery, you know, um, it, it, it just means that there's more. There's more to be discovered. Mm. <laughs> and of course, there's levels of experience. There's the physical level, there's the emotional level, there's the spiritual level. And I think that mystery engages all those different levels in our humanity. And I think God created us to be creators. I'm created to create. And I love the word poem. Poema means something that is made. Mm. <laughs> and that's our task, and it's a task to name things, the beauties of the world around us, to bring them into focus, to reflect something that we have discovered that we want someone else to discover, perhaps for the first time. Mm -hmm. When you were saying that God gave us a task, and you've used it, I think, to launch your book, The Crime of Living Cautiously, can you talk a little bit about that? Do you know what I'm talking about? That parable of oh, the, yes, the talents. The talents. Can you tell <clears throat> that parable and then carry on to give the understanding that you have of how we're not called to live cautiously? Mm. Well, you know, that the parable is about three sons. Their father had to go away for a while and he left them with responsibilities and he gave them money to invest. One of them invested it and gained some interest and that went well and one of them just put the money in a safe place and let it sit and it was not invested so it never brought back any royalties any return for the money and that's a little bit like the way our lives are we need to invest in the riches that are around us that are available to us and not just sit and let things happen you were saying that he took the money and he was safe with it. He was and, safe. And, I, and I feel in your books and your writings, you're not really big on safe. I'm not good on safe. Yeah. What's the problem with safe? <laughs> it's, it's so... What's the problem with safe? It doesn't go anywhere. It's dull and it's dead. Hmm. At least it leads to death. And of course we want our kids to be safe. But we don't want to hem them into such a degree that they never want to reach out and have an adventure or try something new or... Define hemmed in, Lucy. What do you mean by that? Well, if you live like a horse in a meadow, a nice meadow, but it's got fences all around it and it can't get out. And yet there's that amazing world of hills and valleys that the horse wants to enjoy. And I think that's true for human beings. We want to keep people from danger and pride and all the seven deadly sins. And we hem them in so much that there's such fear of moving out of that and experimentation and adventure that our lives just become stilted and stale. There's such a fear of causing negative comment or a judgment. Back to what your mom used to yeah, she, royal against, yes. uh, is it keeping up appearances? Yes, keeping up appearances very much. 
So how do you move against that? How do you get up in the morning and choose to live life differently? For you, Lucy Shaw, what do you do? <laughs> I don't know. What do I do? <laughs> it, it, it just happens so automatically that I don't even have to think about that. But it's, it's uh, opening up my mind to, to culture, to spirituality to the wide world that's available to us as human beings. And we've got these little brains and we've got these little minds and bodies, but they can expand into a powerful thing that can affect the people around us. And we hope the generations that follow us, Mm. we hope. That concept of opening up your mind, I read this quote by you. I'm just going to find it. Here it is. My job as a poet is to be listening, sending up a lightning rod so that the lightning can touch and electrify me. So what does listening mean for you? Well, listening isn't just hearing. You know, you can hear something. You can hear a bird and just notice it. But then if you're really listening, you focus on that and you allow it to speak to you. So listening has a different field than just merely hearing. The messages of nature are so powerful. Nearly all my poetry has to do with some aspect of nature or some experience that I have in the natural world. Mm. I love some of the discoveries of science and how the human mind is just always hungry Mm. for information, for learning more about how life works. Well, not all human minds are like that. I think that's something that has to be nurtured. Yes. That curiosity. Yes. That desire to know. Mm -hmm. You know, you've made reference to nurturing creativity, mystery, and listening. When you are with your children, Lucy, how do you attempt to nurture that in them? I think the the way to do that is to give examples of something that has been powerful in your own thinking and life. As far as children goes, I think I was just too busy <laughs> doing as a the mom laundry yourself. and yeah. making the meals and and you know making sure they got enough sleep and enough vitamins that I was working too hard to nurture the imagination in them. That uh, takes off a lot of pressure to hear you say that. <laughs> I mean, so there's each, no formulas. Each of my five kids has taken a very different path in life and showed different kinds of gifts. I mean, they're all wonderful people, but you cannot project into the future. You have to be open with children, be prepared for whatever it is that you can take or ignore or celebrate or explore. I mean, life is so full of richness in so many directions. Mm -hmm. And yet it all takes creativity and imagination to bring these things into being and to see the, the potential, to see what is there to be explored and expanded. If you were to give, from your life experience, one thought for people to ponder you're, That's you're cooking. scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it more specific. Then one thought to ponder about raising children with an openness to that list of wonderful qualities that you gave, things that you're going to ignore, things that you're going to pay attention to. I love the word Jesus used, behold. Here's something interesting. Look at it. Follow it. I love the idea that you can say to your child, look in this direction, look this way, or look that way. There's something fresh to enter into your life to enrich it, and not just to follow the well-worn ruts of civilization. All the great scientists and poets had these aha moments when suddenly things fall into place and they can move ahead with something fresh. And when you think of all the stimuli and 
the insights we receive on a daily basis, the knowledge we acquire, the wisdom we hear from other people, it can all be put together in our own lives in a way that's creative and wholesome and loving. Hmm. So well, that's that's what's that's why it's so important to expose our children to good literature, to good poetry, to good music, to music that's going to make them stretch a bit. It's not just simplistic, but it has depth of meaning. It has a thickness to it. Do you think we tend to lean towards being too simplistic in what we give to children? It's easier. <laughs> you know, we don't have to think very hard about it. It just, you know, we just do the next thing physically, which is necessary, while neglecting the other parts of the human being, which are the mind, the soul, and the hidden gifts that are waiting there to be woken. Mm. So we took our children camping. That's where you're immersed in the natural world in a way that no words can fully describe. You have to experience it. Experience is what brings wonder. Mm. I wish I could remember the exact quote's not the right word, but, but I've actually heard that reading and camping are two of the key predictors of how a child goes on to do in life. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. That reading. That <laughs> oh, being good. A, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, well, apparently if a child's read five books a day while they're young and they don't have to be long books, the way that enhances their vocabulary, their understand of language, the understand of flow of language, that's very significant. But then they also went on to say that families that camp together, even if it's just for one week of summer, yeah. what that does for a child's brain, a family experience of being in the outdoors is akin to that reading experience. Oh, so, I would absolutely affirm both of those things. Yes, absolutely. You know, experiences like that, you go down to the stream to get your drinking water and fill your canister, and you see a bear in the undergrowth. And yeah, there's a bear, kids. Did you see? Things that happen without your planning them. Something fresh and new that expands our whole soul. Mm -hmm. You've used the word soul a few times. It's a word that I think is coming back more for mm -hmm. us to consider and engage with. What does the word soul mean to you? I think it's the elemental part of us that makes us individuals. Mm -hmm. And it's capable of being enriched and expanded. It's a living thing. It's not static. It's hungry for richness and for information and for experience, the soul. I mean, that's, that's an essential part of the human being, is to have this capacity to move beyond ourselves. Yeah. Move beyond ourselves. Can you say a little bit more about that? I think it takes courage to be a human being. It would be easy to protect yourself, that it's easy just to sort of guard yourself and surround yourself with safe things. But that's a very dry and uninteresting way to live. Mm -hmm. You have to take risks. I think you have to allow your kids to take risks. Otherwise, they're never going to experience the the excitement of taking a risk and having it work out to be something wonderful. Mm. Lucy, is there anything else that you want to say before we close off? Anything that I'm sure I'll think of about a dozen things I want to say after you've gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I thank you so much. It has been so wonderful to be able to sit and talk with you and probe into your mind. And Oh, well, it's a privilege to talk to someone who asks the right questions. Well, you know, I, you uh, really do. And I just wish I were a little bit more fluent in my answers. I, oh, I you've been beautifully <laughs> fluent. Thank you so much. I have to say I was holding myself back from not being a little bit fangirl as we are interviewing <laughs> Lucy. She is just wonderful. She is wonderful. And I caught you out of the corner of my eye a number of times as you were recording and you seemed really into it as well. I was. And I just, uh, you know, of all the interviews we've done, this was very, very special. Mm -hmm. One, uh, Lucy is a friend of mine mm -hmm. and two, at her age. 
Yeah, 91. Uh, yeah, yeah, with all that wisdom and perception and lightheartedness. Yeah. Yeah. I love how she could reflect back on her childhood and her growing up years with a willingness to explore those experiences. You know, her good friend, Madeline Lengo, is well known for being very quotable. Mm -hmm. And you and I were looking at some of her quotes. Yeah. And this one really stood out. Yeah, because I think it made us wonder if this is something she discovered alongside Lucy, which is beautiful. Yeah. So what's the quote? The great thing about getting older is that you don't lose all the other ages you've been. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a wonderful quote? It is. And so much what we saw with Lucy. Yes. Thank you, Lucy Shaw. Thank you, Madeline Lengo. We love you both. Oh, there's the fan girl. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to Family 360. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Rate the show, leave a comment, and tell a friend. Each Family 360 episode ends with music inspired by the words of our guest. You heard bits and pieces of this music during this interview. Here's the song, When I Was Very Young. And you can find it in our resource section for every episode or wherever you stream music. I'm Rachel Cram. I'm Roy Salmond. And thank you so much for listening to Family 360. 360.
To continue these conversations, find us at Family360 on our website, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'd love to journey with you.